to the word of God, that your word, that we might see ourselves in the word, help us to understand that you love us so much that when you show us something in our lives, it's not to condemn us, but to deliver us, to get us to see by keeping that particular negative thing in our life, that will be the very thing that will destroy our faith. So you're so gracious, so gracious to show us things in our lives and give us and gives us the, the power to overcome those things. So I want to thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray now that our hearts are open, that the spirit of wisdom and revelation would rest upon each and every one of us, and that we would see clearly what you want to show us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I remember, before I go into the Word, uh, I just want to share this. I remember years ago, I tried to hide everything from God. Was you ever there? I don't want God to know this, you know. He might send a little lightning down here. <laughs> See, you see, before I learned that, see, that's what happened to my hair. Now you know, see, so. <laughs> but he knows everything anyway, right down to the detail. So just tell him about your weaknesses, you know. And, and see, we have a great high priest that is touched with our infirmities. He's touched with our weaknesses. He understands us. And so... When the word by reading the word of God or the preacher or whoever teaches hits a particular area in your life, don't throw rocks at the pastor. I can't take too many more rocks. <laughs> and please don't throw no cement blocks at me. That that's really rough. Just say, Lord, thank you that that you you've exposed that in my life, and now I need your help, O oh Lord, to overcome it. And that's how you overcome. I don't hear. I don't hear one amen in this place. I mean, just give me one. Give me a, just a little breeze here, little little a. Come on, a little. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, if you understood uh, what I said tonight, now you're on your way to be perfected by the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. All right. Our first uh, we want to turn to is uh, the scriptures at Acts 26, and uh, we want to start with verse uh, 12. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Apostle Paul. Remember, the Apostle Paul is the apostles to the Gentiles, okay? That's who we are. We're Gentiles. Either a Jew or you're a Gentile. And so God anointed him and called him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. If you know your Bible, you know what I'm talking about. Peter was the apostle to the Jews, okay? So... I want to share a little bit about Paul, and he's given his uh, testimony here to uh, a king, O King Agrippa. And this is found in 12. Here we go. Preaching to them the kingdom of God, at teaching them about the Lord Jesus Christ with boldness and quite openly. That's, that's good. And without being molested or hindered. Now, that's 28. I want 26, 12. 26, 12. That's pretty good, though, isn't it? Right there. I like that. <laughs> All right, here we go. Thus engaged, I proceeded. Now, now Paul has given his testimony now to this king, Agrippa. He says, thus engaged, I proceeded to Damascus with the authority and orders of the chief priests. Next, just move right on down to the next now. 13. When on the road at midday, O king, I saw a light from heaven. Now he's explaining his conversion. And he saw this light from heaven surpassing the brightness of the sun, flashing about me and those who were traveling with me. And the next verse. And when we had all fallen to the ground. I, I love that. I just love to see the whole congregation <laughs> fall to the ground, you know. Uh, we've seen a lot of people do that, you know, over the years. But notice this. I heard a voice in the Hebrew tongue saying to me, Saul, Saul, why do you continue to persecute me? Now, you know, when I read that years ago, I thought, hmm. 
Paul wasn't persecuting Jesus. But then I read on and found out that when you persecute his body on earth, you're persecuting Jesus. Someone say, ouch. Boy, that's, see, that's revelation now. So if you've done any uh, backbiting or anything like that, just repent. God has made provisions. Confess it, and God will cleanse you up. Amen? And don't do it no more. Now, when I learned that, I began to clean up my mouth a little bit and let God do some work in my heart. Now, how many sees that in there, what I just said? You, you see that? See, it's important that we see. <clears throat> okay. Why do you continue to persecute me, to harass and trouble and molest me? Now, Jesus is talking to Paul. And how many of you know what Paul has been doing? Catching the, the saints and putting them in jail and beating them and doing all kinds of things, you know. And he didn't realize he, when he did that to them, he was doing that to Jesus. And boy, when that revelation hit me, wow. It is dangerous and dangerous and turns out badly for you to keep kicking against the, the goats to keep offering vain and perilous resistance. Wow. So resist the devil, but don't resist the Lord. Now, when you understand that, see, that will revolutionize your life. It did mine. It sort of reminds me when uh, the Lord appeared to uh, Peter. Remember, uh, the Lord said, uh, this sheet came down from heaven and all these uh, animals that were considered uh, unclean to the Jews. And the Lord says, kill and eat, Peter. And Peter said, no way, Lord. I don't eat anything unclean. And, 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 and God scolded him and said, wait a minute, Peter. Don't you call what I have cleansed unclean anymore. Anybody get any revelation on that? Let me see your hand if you got a revelation. Oh, boy, you're really growing. We're going to have a sanctified church here directly. I tell you, I'm looking forward to it. So, you, 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 so, so I, quit, I quit calling myself uh, unclean. I'm righteous in his righteousness, and so are you. Say, don't ever waver from that, you know. Don't ever waver from that. What the Lord has done, what the Lord has cleansed up, don't call it unclean anymore. Okay? And that's a bad habit that many Christians have had, and I had that habit too. But there again, I had to grow and quit doing that foolishness. You know, even the ground that, that when, when Moses was there at the burning bush and, 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 and God says, take off your, your sandals, the ground is holy. <laughs> I mean, wow, anything God touches becomes holy. Has God touched you? Amen. Wave at me, man. Ha! Yeah, man, you know you, you wouldn't be here tonight if you didn't have touched you. So see yourself totally different now. All right, now, let's finish reading this. This is pretty good, isn't it? All right, let's go to the next verse. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, wait a minute. You stop and you think and you read that unless you have revelation knowledge. And then, then you begin to understand, oh, when you persecute the saints, you're persecuting Jesus. So when people start persecuting you... But better remind them, keep your, hand, keep your big mouth off of me. How many understand what I'm talking about? Because you, you want to help them out. You see? All right, go to the next verse. But arise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. What is that? That I might appoint you to serve as my minister and to bear witness both to what you have seen of me and to that in which I will appear to you. Now, some people think that Jesus is still dead. But how many of you know he, he, he resurrected? And he is seated at the right hand side of the Father. And he's the head of this church. He's the head of his church. You got to remember that. 
and he's the risen Lord, and he's seated at the right hand side of the Father, and he's still given orders through the Holy Spirit to the church. Okay, now we got to see that. And then we see Jesus here. He's in his resurrected body. He's in heaven, and yet he's talking to Saul, who's on the earth. How did he do that? <laughs> How he do that? <laughs> he's God. Nothing in, is impossible to him. Amen? Amen? So I want you to see that, that God still talks to people even today. All right? Let's go to the next verse. Choosing you out, selecting you for myself. Now, I want to say something. All of us have been selected for him. We belong to him. So you got to get that in your heart and your mind. I don't belong to myself anymore because I'll self-destruct. Are you, are you listening? You will self-destruct. you got to know that you belong to him and he is your source and he will guide you and direct you and even show you things yet to come. See, we've got to get that relationship with the Holy Spirit to know that he is directing my life. Now, I brought that up the other day. and It's in Ephesians. In fact, turn real quick to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Now, we'll come back to that. All right, here we go. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's own handiwork. Everybody say, I am, I am. God's own handiwork. Okay. So, can I be cruel and say, get your mouth off yourself? I'm saying that gentle, gently. Okay. Sometimes we are our worst enemy. His workmanship. Hmm. How many would criticize his workmanship? I don't think anybody heard me. How many would criticize his workmanship? Huh? <laughs> See, when the church grows up, there's some things we don't do no more. See, if I criticize you, who am I criticizing? Jesus. And I'm criticizing his handiwork. And when you criticize yourself, you're criticizing God's handiwork. Well, I don't like the way you made me, Lord. I mean, you know, now, now, let's, let's get serious. I look pretty good, don't I? Remember, I'm his workmanship. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> when you look at the mirror, you say, thank you, Jesus. You're doing a good job. Come on. See, we got to get down to realize that we are God's workmanship, and he's got a plan for us, and he don't make no junk. Look what it says there now. This is powerful. Recreate it. We ain't like we used to be. We've been recreated, and that's all through the scriptures. Our inner man has been Recreated, brand new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a brand new creation. Your spirit man is. Okay? And one day these bodies will be transformed too. Just like his body. We'll have a body just like he did. Born anew that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand... For us. There's no question in my life, as I look back on my life, and I go all the way back when I was just a little boy in Washington, D.C. I was born in Washington, D.C. Don't hold that against me now. And I can look all those years and everything and see God's hand just directing me and guiding me. All the way up to this moment, I, I, could, I could write a book on it. I mean, even to the point, realize if, if, I, if this didn't happen, just think, I wouldn't have met Susan. Yeah, you, you'll see certain things happened where, where, where God can, how many of you understand what I'm talking about? Certain things. Okay, now look at that now. Uh, 
taken, no, right, <clears throat> before, planned beforehand for us, taken past, which he, God, prepared ahead of time. That you should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Whew. Powerful. Write that down and study. All right, let's go back to Acts. So now Jesus is talking to the Apostle Paul to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. <clears throat> when you witness to people, now remember the God of this world has blinded the, <clears throat> the, the minds of the unbelievers from the glorious light of the gospel. You might say, why are they think that way? They're blind. If they're not saved, if they haven't been born anew, they're blind. Ain't no need to get all ruffled up about it. Ain't no need to fuss at them. Just love them where they're at. Because after, after all, while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us while we were. Remember that? Mm -hmm. In fact, he saved us while we were yet sinners. Everybody hear me okay? Okay. <clears throat> So that they may thus receive forgiveness and release from their sins. Have you been released from your sins? Wave at me. Yeah, you have. Absolutely. And a place and portion among those who are consecrated and purified by faith in me. Now that was Paul's job. Jesus was outlining it for him. And basically that's our job too. All right, read a little bit more. I mean, go a little bit more. <clears throat> All right, no, let's stop there. Okay. Well, anyway, let me read that since he got on the board. Wherefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. And that's what we want to do, to make sure that we are faithful and persevere and continue to do what the Lord has told us all to do. Now, I want you to turn over, if you will, and let's go to um, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, I said that Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. That's why I do a lot of studying in his epistles. An epistle is a letter that he wrote to the churches. And so he's our apostle. So we, we, we read his letters. It's um, 13 letters I think Paul wrote. One, some say he wrote Hebrews, whatever. And Paul received eight secrets Eight mysteries that was not revealed to the other apostles. Okay? That's all in the scriptures. How many of you know that four or five weeks ago we were talking about the mysteries of God? Remember that? Uh, Jesus told the mystery of the kingdom. That's the one he shared with his apostles. John had two mysteries and Paul had eight that was not known in the Old Testament and was not known during Jesus' time on the earth. It was revealed when Paul came on the scene and it was revealed to Paul from the resurrected Lord. These eight mysteries, okay? One is Christ in our heart is our only hope of glory. Now, that was not revealed to anybody in the Old Testament or even during Jesus' time on the earth. But when Paul came along, the resurrected Lord revealed that mystery to him that Christ lives in our heart by the power of the whole, by the person of the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, and the other one, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to mention one more, was the mystery of of the rapture. See, the the second coming of Christ was in the Old Testament, Zechariah. Okay, other Old Testament scriptures. Jeremiah brings that up. That was revealed all the way through. The other apostles knew about that, but they didn't know about the rapture. That was revealed to the apostle uh, Paul, okay? And so when you read the scriptures, there's two things I want you to remember. The Bible talks about 
the day of Christ, which is the rapture, and then the day of the Lord. Two things, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. Okay, now the day of the Lord was in the Old Testament. And it was also all through the New Testament. And it, and it is carried out in the book of Revelation, the day of the Lord. But then there's the day of Christ, which is the rapture. So I want to hit that a little bit tonight. And we want to start with um, uh, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 15. Um, let's start with um, verse 51. 51. Now we're going to be talking about a little bit about the... the um, the day of Christ and then the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord is the judgment of God upon this earth, upon the wicked. Okay? Very clear in the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament. Okay? But the day of Christ is the catching up of the saints. Now, when Paul wrote the Corinthian church, there were some people in the church confusing the Christians. And uh, some of them said, well, the resurrection has already happened and all of this got the people. So Paul writes this letter and, and, and clarifies it. So in verse 51, look what he says now. Take notice. All right. Now, that means us and them. I tell you a what? A mystery. That's a secret truth that nobody knew before. Until God, Christ, gave it to Paul. And he says, I'm going to tell you a mystery. Well, what could it be? Well, let's read on and we'll find out what it is. <clears throat> and even uh, an event, an event decreed by the hidden purpose or counsel of God, that mystery was hidden in God. And at the right time, he revealed it to Paul, the mystery. We shall not all fall asleep. Now, we shall not all fall asleep, talking to Christians, in death. Boy, that's good news, isn't it? But we shall all be changed, transformed. Now, that's new revelation. A lot of people, you might think in your family, knows that. They don't know that. That's why I'm trying to teach where you can go out and teach. Now, we're talking about the mystery here. All right, let's go on. Now, let's find out what this mystery is. Well, he just told us. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet call, <coughs> for a trumpet will sound. Now, I don't, I don't know if the unbelievers, I don't believe the unbelievers will hear that sound. But I really believe those that have died in Christ will, and I think we will, that are alive when that happens. Now, I'm going to say something. Some of you will not, will not be out there in the graveyard because you're going to be caught up. You're going to be out of here. Are you ready? I just love it. I'm a preacher over here. <laughs> I like a little vibration from the, you know. All right, now look. At the sound of the last trumpet call, for a trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ. Now that means those folks out there in the graveyard. Now, we know that their spirit is already with the Lord. Now we've got to unfold this thing for you where you can understand. Yeah. Oh, woo. See you later. I'm heading up. Thank you. I needed that. <clears throat> For a trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable, free and immune from decay. And we shall be changed or transformed. Okay. Now, here's the sequence. The trumpet will blow. The dead in Christ will rise first. Their bodies will come out. Now, we got something going on up here now. Now, the Lord is coming back with their spirits. And the trumpet is being blasted, and they're coming out. Their bodies are, which have been which has been transformed into grave. Now, someone said, "Will it, will it mess up the dirt?" <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? I'm getting out of here. <laughs> 
No, I personally think that we're just, you know, when you go back and you see Jesus and his resurrected body. Now, remember, they were all in the upper room and they uh, had the door locked and then Jesus appeared. You remember that? You see? And he didn't open the door. He just come through the, 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 the roof or the a wall or the whatever. And, and he disappeared the same way. I like that. You see me? And then you don't. <laughs> All right. Here we go. We'll be raised imperishable, free and immune from decay. And we shall be changed, transformed. So the, 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 the picture is that when the trumpet is blasted, the body's in the grave and it's transformed right there and it comes up out of the grave to meet the Lord in the air and to meet his spirit coming back with the Lord and coming into that transformed body, okay, but never, never landing on the earth. Now remember, when, when the rapture happens, Jesus comes down in the air and we all meet him in the air. The second coming... We come back with him in our glorified bodies, riding white horses. Come on, boy, let's roll. I love it. Jesus will be on his white horse, and he'll land, we'll land right on Mount Olive. Boop. So, that's the two different things that, that's going to happen. Okay, let's go back a little bit here. Let's read a little bit more now. Okay, here we go. For this perishable part of us, which these bodies are not, uh, they're not saved yet, okay? They're still perishable, okay? We'll put a nature, and this mortal part of us, the nature that is capable of dying, must put on immortality, freedom from death. So that will happen uh, in the bodies of the believers, in the grave, and They'll come on up through the, through the dirt, right on through the casket, right on through everything. Concrete, it don't make a difference what it is. Up and away we go. All right, go to the next one. And when this perishable, which is talking about our bodies, puts on the imperishable, which will be a resurrected body, and this that was capable of dying, which are these bodies, put on freedom from death, then shall be fulfilled the scriptures that says death is swallowed up, utterly vanished forever in and unto a victory. Amen. Boy, that's powerful. Now, here's what I want you to see. We say, well, how can that happen? How many of you know nothing is too hard for the Lord? Okay. So if you have any doubts, go back and see some of the other miracles that our Lord has did. Now, I want us to turn over uh, uh, to um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians verse, chapter 4, verse 13. And Paul brings this out a little bit more clear. Now, remember this, what he just said was a mystery. They, now, let me say this. The resurrection from the dead was not a mystery, okay? I think it's in John. We won't turn there right now. But in John, I think it's in 11. We may turn there later. Here's what Jesus has said. He says, he that believeth in me, though he be dead, yet shall he live. All right, that's the resurrection. And then he that believeth in me shall never die. Well, that's the person that's alive when Jesus comes down to take us home. How many of you see that? In other words, right now, right this minute, if Jesus was coming down, we wouldn't die. We'd be changed in the twinkling of an eye and go up, and then we could say, O death, where's thy sting? O grave, where's thy victory? The grave will never, never touch us. How many sees it? Okay? So you can tie those together. Okay. Now, let's, let's read here. And... Uh, People were mixed up back in those days, like they are now. And uh, look what he says. Now also we would not have you ignorant. Well, that's a good statement. Paul is talking. And uh, I don't want to be ignorant either. Because um, I want to know the truth. And the truth is going to set us free. Brethren, 
about those who fall asleep in death, that you may not grieve for them as the rest do who have no hope beyond the grave. Now let's look at that now. Look what it says. Paul don't want us to be ignorant about those that have fallen asleep and we had their funeral. See, in the New Testament, they use sleep. They don't use death too much. They don't say he died. They just say that Christian fell asleep, you see. All right, look what it says. That you may not grieve for them. Now, we're going to do a little grieving. A little grieving will do you good, but we don't have to grieve because we have knowledge of where they're at. In fact, they're probably up there grieving for us, being left, <laughs> left down there in that mess. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's just we'll put that to one side. But we don't have to grieve when we lose a, a loved one. And it's only natural to grieve, and we understand that, and we should have a certain time of grieving. But I've had to deal with people who just kept grieving three years later. Because you can invite the enemy in your life by doing that. So it's a time to grieve, time to get over it, and let's get on with God. Amen? And that's about anything, anything like that. But when you know your loved one has received God's forgiveness through Christ, they've confessed with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and they have believed in their heart that God raised him from the dead, so therefore they are saved. You know that. You're hurting, natural. We're still in these, these perishable bodies. But we don't have to grieve three or four or five years later because we ought to start rejoicing to say, wow, they've graduated. They're with the Lord. See, we have that understanding and, and, and get that right thinking on that. So let's read on here a little bit now. Okay, look at verse 14. Next verse, 14. Here we go. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do we believe that? Yes. All right, since we believe that, Paul says, even so God will also bring with him, through Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in death. That is, those spirits that are up there. Now we know that um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 says what? Absent from the body... Present with the Lord. So when they quit breathing, their spirit comes out of their body and goes to be with the Lord. So now when Jesus comes back, he's going to bring them. He's going to bring them that have previously died, bring their spirits back. And then their bodies will come up transformed into the image of Christ's body. And their spirits will meet their bodies. But they'll never land on earth and they'll just turn around and go back to heaven at that time. And we'll spend seven years up there. How many of you know that we're the bride of Christ? Amen. So comb your hair every once in a while. I mean, if you don't have any, then you don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> but we are the bride of Christ. A, the Bible talks a lot about the bride of Christ. And he's not going to leave his bride down here to go through the tribulation years. Because the Bible says he saved us from the wrath of God. Okay. Now, I want to stop right there for a moment. Turn to Jude chapter 1 verse 14 and 15. Then we'll come back there. Jude. Naturally, it's just one chapter. So 14 and 15. Here we go. Now, Enoch has a little prophecy here he wants us to listen to. Look at the board. It was of these people. And when you read prior to all of that. It's these many wicked people on the earth that's doing all their wickedness, all right? And uh, Enoch prophesied about these people, and it says, that It was of these people, moreover, that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied when he said, What did you say, Enoch? Behold, the Lord comes with his, somebody help me with that, mit mitrate? All right, that's close enough. Of holy ones. Ten thousands of his saints. Now, the question I have, and it seems only reasonable to me, how'd they get up there? Hello? Huh? We know how they got up there. Yeah, we know how they got up there. 
when they died on the earth, their spirit was absent from the body, present with the Lord. Okay, see, see, when you, see sometimes you have to know these scriptures and these scriptures to rightly interpret this scripture. How I many you understand that? Okay, now, pay attention to me now because I want to teach you something. I spent 60 years studying this, so pay attention. Look what it says now. Behold, I like that, the Lord comes with the my trait of holy ones, ten thousands of his saints. So when we read that, we got to realize they had to get up there to come back with him. All right, so when you get over there in Thessalonians, you see the same thing. They're coming back with him in their spirit, man. Okay, now go to the next verse. Now, this is what I just read. He's coming back with the saints. He's coming back to judge the world. And why is he coming? To execute judgment upon all Christians. Huh? No. All and to convict all the impious unholy ones of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the severe, abusive, jarring things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, against Christ. So he's coming back with the saints at the second coming of Christ. He'll be on white horses there. And that's in Revelation, what, 19. Talks about that. I wish we could, you know, spend a couple, two or three hours here. But I get sleepy at this time of the night. So we won't go that far. So I want you to see that. Nail that down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when he comes back the second time, he's going to judge the world. And he's going to set up his kingdom. And it won't be a democracy. Okay. I hate to tell you, but it's going to be a dictatorship. He's Lord. You ain't going to have to vote on anything. In fact, you don't, you don't even vote on anything now. You just, we just obey, right? But see, he is a precious dictator. And you can easily submit to somebody that you know that loves you. Okay, so I'm just throwing that in there. So learn to obey him now and know he that fathers know father knows best. Okay, now let's go to back to Thessalonians now. All right. And that was uh, 14 verse 14 back to 14 now. Uh, verse uh, Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 14. First, uh, yeah, you go. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we said we believe that, didn't we? Uh, if, you, if you're not, you better talk to me. Even so, God will also bring with him those, Jesus, through Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in death. So we know that all of our brothers and sisters that knew the Lord that have died are up there now. And when Jesus comes back, what we call the rapture or the snatching up of the saints. The word rapture is a English word that we use to get us to understand this. But really what we're talking about is the resurrection. Okay. So we know that he's going to bring them back. And of course their bodies are coming out of the grave being transformed. They'll come back in those uh, bodies. And they go back to be with the Lord for seven years and the marriage supper will be up there and then we'll come back on those white horses. Now go to the next verse. Now Paul is making this very clear. He don't want us to be ignorant on these things. For this we declare to you by the Lord's own word. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Shall in no way proceed into his presence. Or have any advantage at all over those who have previously fallen asleep in him in death. So very simple. Paul is simply saying the dead in Christ, their bodies will rise first. And then when they come up in their spirits, and it's going to happen like that in the twinkling of an eye, we're right here and then boop, we, we're transformed and we go up to meet the Lord in the air. Now he's not on no white horses here. How many see that? He is not on any white horses here. The, the, the terminology between the second coming and, and, the, and the rapture, the terminology is totally different. Everything is different. 
The second coming, he's riding on white horses. The second coming, we're on white horses. At the rapture, we just caught up. Got our glorified bodies, go up, and we go back to heaven with him. Okay, seven years. And when you go into the Bible and you study about the Jewish uh, ceremonies of marriage and all, you know, they just don't get married. I mean, they get married to have a big feast like seven days, something like that, you know. I mean, seven days. <laughs> all right. Now, look what it says here. The next verse. 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven, and he's not going to land on Mount Olive. That's over in Revelation 19. How many know that? So you've got to compare uh, the, 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 the day of Christ and the day of the Lord, totally different, okay? Now, the day of the Lord is in the Old Testament. The rapture is a mystery. It was kept from those people back there in the Old Testament. It was kept from the other apostles. It only was revealed when the apostle Paul came on the scene, and the risen Lord gave him the revelation of that, okay? All right, look what it says. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud cry of summons, now, he don't do that over in Revelation when he's on a horse. He don't go, you know, coming to high hole silver, away we go. No, he's coming down. <laughs> he's a loud cry of some, with the shout of the archangel and with the blast of the trumpet of God. And those who have departed this life in Christ will rise first. So the people in the grave, they've departed. Their bodies will come out of the grave. Okay, I'll go to the next verse. Then we, that's us, that's why I say some of you will be alive when that happens. I might even be alive. Who knows? I mean, things are shaping up today. I guess you all understand that, don't you? Man, this just takes so much time to unfold these things, but I hope you've been seeing what's going on here, if you know what the Scripture talks about in the last days and everything. Anyway, then we, the living ones who remain on the earth, shall simultaneously be caught up along with the resurrected dead. Now, when the Lord comes on his white horse, he's, this earth is in total chaos. Chaotic. It's a chaotic condition. I mean, there's a war going over there in Jerusalem. I mean, the Jews are being surrounded. I mean, there's a lot we need to, to, to share with you, but it just takes time. All right, here we go. The resurrection day in the clouds, where are we going to meet the Lord? Watch out for them cloudy days. Don't curse them too bad. <laughs> Lord, is this it? <laughs> in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so always through the eternities of eternities, we shall be with the Lord. Okay? Now, let's run over real quick. I've got another three hours yet. Okay. Uh, Revelation 19. <laughs> Just kidding, you don't get too excited on that. Look at 19. Are we there? Mm -mm -mm. And let's pick out a few things. Let's start with verse uh, uh, 7. 19 7. Now, how many of you know that? Uh, Christ has come back for his bride, which the church is his bride. Israel is the bride of God. The church is the bride of Christ, okay? We will reign with him throughout eternity, okay? Okay, let us rejoice and shout for joy. How you do that? <laughs> Whee! <laughs> All right, that's pretty good. A little practice makes perfect. Exalting and triumphs. Let us celebrate and ascribe to him glory and honor for the marriage of the Lamb at last has come and his bride has prepared herself. Well, what are we going to do when we get to heaven? That's what's going to happen. We're going to have a marriage ceremony up there. Amen. All right, then let's see. Uh, where are we going to get all those pretty gowns? Well, the Bible tells us. Let's read on and see where we get it. Look at verse 8. 
She has been permitted to dress in fine, radiant linen, dazzling and white. For the fine linen is, signifies, and represents the righteousness, the upright and just and godly living deeds and conduct and right standing with God of the saints, God's holy people. So the things that we do down here, the various deeds we do for God down here is, is part of our uh, wedding gown, okay? And our righteousness that he provides for us. So this is all symbolic as you see this, that we have prepared, the wedding is being prepared. And um, I'm not sure what they're going to have for dinner, but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I, I think the king's going to have something really good for, for, some, for us, for the bride. Okay. All right, go to the next verse. Then the angel said to me, okay, talking about John. John was caught up. You know, he's up there and he's seeing all of this. And the angel's talking to him. He says, write, write this down. Blessed, happy to be envied are those who are summoned, invited, called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, Father, these are the true words, the genuine and exact decoration of God. So we know that, that that's what's going to be happening up there. Now, we've got to get up there if we're going to have the marriage supper. And we know that the rapture has been provided for that. The elevator's coming down, we're getting on it, and we're going to go up. You understand that type of language? Okay. So we've got to get up there if we're going to, have, you know, uh, take part in the marriage because we're the bride, Okay. We don't want to keep Jesus waiting at the altar. We want to be up there and make sure that we have uh, our marriage outfit on. Okay, look at the next now. Then I fell prostrate. Now John's talking here. At his feet to worship, to pay divine honor to him. That is to the angel. But he restrained me and said, refrain. You must not do that. I am only another servant with, uh, uh, with you and your brethren who have accepted and hold the testimony born of Jesus. Worship God for the substance essence of the truth revealed by Jesus is the spirit of all prophecy, the vital breath, the inspiration of all inspired preaching and interpretation of the divine will and purpose, including both mine and yours. All right, go to the next verse. After that, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Oh, boy, I was waiting on that horse, wasn't you? <laughs> Appeared. The one who was riding it is called Faithful, Trustworthy. Now, Jesus is appearing here, and he's on his white horse. And, and, and John gives a description of what's taking place there in heaven now. Who is riding it, it is called faithful, trustworthy, loyal, incorruptible, steady, and true. And he, passed, and he passes judgment and wages war in righteousness, holiness, and justice, and uprightness. Now, how many of you know, when he comes back on the white horse, and we're with him, He's, be, he's going to wage war against the ungodly on this earth. Okay? All right. Now, I want to stop here for a moment. We had a phone call the other day, and the question was, well, how, being that God is a loving God, how can he send somebody to hell? And I've had people over the years talk to me about that. Well, let me say first, he don't send anybody to hell. Amen. I'm going to say that again. He doesn't send anybody to hell. How many of you know, just like Adam and Eve, he gave them a choice. See, we don't realize the value of our will. You don't want no will? Then you just be a robot. God wants people to make a decision to love him and serve him. 
I don't want my wife to serve me because I put fear in her to serve me. I want her to serve me because she loves me. See, love, God is a loving father, loving God, and he's given us a will. And he says, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. And we choose to serve him. And therefore, there's a beautiful relationship there that comes into place when we choose to submit to God. And what a beautiful relationship that is. The same thing in marriage. When two people come together and they submit one to another, what a beautiful relationship that is it. That's why you have so many divorces today, because a lot of times nobody wants to submit to one another. Okay? Uh, Adam and it, 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 Eve, same thing. All those nice trees and all of that, the tree of life. There's only one tree now, the knowledge of, of good and evil. He put a choice. And Eve, we know she was deceived, but Adam willfully disobeyed God. And that's why we're in the trouble we are in today. But God's causing good to come out of it. Because he's allowed us to be born again and have a recreated spirit. Because, see, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in his spirit. So out of death came life, and now that our spirits have been born again, we can worship God who is a spirit. Okay? Now... Do you want everybody just to tell you what to do? Or would you like to have a will? And maybe they might be like, I think I'd like to go fishing today. But see, if you didn't have no will, no, you got to stay in work. You wouldn't like that. You have a will. We have wills. But that's why Jesus said, Lord, not my will, but thy will would be done. See, Jesus had a will of his own. But he said, no, not my will. And that's where we come to to realize that when we allow God to be our choice, that he knows best. How many remember the movie, Daddy Knows Best? Let me see your hands. It used to be a movie like that. How many know God knows best? Now, we can, we can not choose his way and get into trouble. Let me know that. See, see Adam and Eve... Lord, uh, we don't need you to guide us. See, we have this knowledge now of good and evil, so we can pick uh, what is right and what is uh, evil or what is good. We got that knowledge now. We can take care of it. Don't need you, Lord. Goodbye. Now, wait a minute. He's the source of all life. But yet, he would not take our will away, even though he knew that a lot of damage could come. But when we choose to say, Lord, I know you know best. Ephesians 2, verse 10, you have laid out my life to walk. I know you know best, and I'm going to walk the way you chose and build that relationship with our Heavenly Father by an act of my will that I choose to glorify him. I choose to serve him. Nobody makes me choose, uh, uh, makes me serve God. I have done it by my own will, and so have you. And there's a freedom in that. You want to walk away? Go ahead. You got a will. God don't send nobody to hell. They send themselves to hell by not Understanding that God knows best and his ways are best. But he loves man enough to give him a will and let man choose. That's why the Bible says, choose, choose you, you choose you this day whom you're going to serve. You go back in Deuteronomy, Moses said the same thing. I put before you life and death. Here's what God says, or Moses said, or God said through Moses, choose life that you might live. Aren't you glad you've chosen life? You chose life. God chose you. Amen. God chose you before the foundation of the world. Now, let's just say that you've got a hundred cattle. And you've got one cattle. How many of you know a, little comp a, a bad company corrupts good morals? Okay. That's in that chapter right there. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
you got one cattle that's got a disease. You've got 100 cattle, and one of them got a disease. If you leave that one cattle in there with the other 99, how many of you know they're going to catch that disease, and all of them will die? So God gives man a chance to get right, and if he chooses not to, he has to deal with it, that wicked one, and, and remove him where the other 99 can live. Hello? Are you out there? Yeah. See, we must understand these things that... God sends nobody to hell. It is God's will that no man perish, that all should come to repentance. That's his will. But man has a will. That's why it says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Nail that down and don't move from it. I've nailed it down years ago and haven't wavered from that one bit. And I know some of you have too. Okay. Let's, let's finish reading this here. All right. We've got about five more minutes. I'll let you go. His eyes blaze like a flame of fire, and on his head are many kingly crowns, diadems, and he has a title name described which he alone knows or can understand. And go over to, uh, what verse is that? 12. Go, okay. All right. Go ahead, 13. Now, he's coming back. Remember in uh, Jude, chapter 1, verse 14, he is dressed in a robe, dyed by dipping in blood, and the title by which he is called is the Word of God. All right, go to the next one. And the troops of heaven, who are they? Clothed in fine linen, dazzling and clean, followed him on white horses. Will you read over there a little bit about, that's us. We're the one that's closed. And the troops of heaven, that's us. We were the bride, and now we're the troops. We got brogans on now. And we're on white horses. And we're the troops. And we are clothed in fine linen, dazzling and clean. Follow him on white horses. Wow. All right. Read a little bit for, further, and then we'll quit here. I'll get you all too excited. From his mouth goes forth a sharp sword with which he can smite, afflict, strike the nations, and, will, and he will shepherd and control them with a staff, scepter, rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath and indignation of God and all the rulers and mighty ones the uh, omnipotent. Now let me say at this point, when he comes down, the Antichrist is on the earth and he's deceived all these people and they've, they've lined up with him. They took his mark and they said, we want to serve the Antichrist. We want to serve Satan. So God says, well, good. we've got a clean house. So he has to come down, come back, and he cleans house. He sets up his kingdom. And for 1,000 years, there'll be peace on this earth. We'll be here on the earth in our glorified bodies. Now, over here in, uh, uh, put uh, Revelation 20, verse 4. During the, during the tribulation years, a lot of people that, that did accept Christ during that period of time, you have 144,000 uh, Jews that are preaching, and many of the people get saved. They don't take the mark, and so the anti, Antichrist cuts their head off, and you read in Revelation 7 that they're up there in heaven. And so here in verse 4, we see that they're resurrected to reign with Christ for a thousand years. So let's read this. Then I saw thrones. Is that verse 4? I can't really see it. That's verse 4. Okay. Is that verse 4? Then I saw the thrones and sitting on them were those, yeah, to, I recognize it now, to whom authority to act as judges and to pass sentence was entrusted. And also I saw the souls of those who had been slain with the axe. Boy, aren't you glad you ain't going to be here? You know, if the church is going to be here, I better, I better stop my preaching and start preaching another way. Sell these steel things that you can put around your neck. When the axe comes down, it won't hurt you. 
I mean, how, how many do you understand? We need to start teaching. The, we better start teaching the church. You're going to get the axe. <laughs> But that ain't the way I interpret the scripture. So if you don't like the way I interpret it, I think you got a problem. Anyway, and, I, and also I saw the souls of those who had been slain with axes beheaded for their seeing to Jesus and for the preaching and testifying for the word of God and who had refused to pay homage to the beast or his statue and had not accepted his bark or permitted it to be stamped on their forehead or on their hands, and they lived again and ruled with Christ the Messiah a thousand years. So they lived. In other words, they were resurrected. Remember, they were in heaven. Revelation 7. Okay. But anyway, they, they uh, come alive and, and all, and then get in their... In their uh, transform into the glorified bodies, and they reign also with Christ for that thousand years. Now, we're already in our glorified bodies. Remember, we came back on the white horses. Remember that? White horses? Okay. So anyway, the time's passed so quick. I hope you learn a little some. But it's like putting a puzzle together. Uh, I, I got scriptures on Zechariah, Jeremiah, about uh, uh, all, all of this. It's just so many of them, but it's like putting a puzzle together and you get all these little pieces of puzzle and you put it together and all of a sudden the picture is formed and you see, oh, I see. And I hope maybe I've put, uh, helped you a little bit tonight. All right, that's good. Thank you so much. Now, any questions you have tonight?